you were famous, you are famous, for building the music recommender system from scratch at Spotify. So I think it goes without saying that Spotify is the most used music streaming service in the world. Um, and you built the original music recommender system. It's used by hundreds of millions of people every day in the world. Yeah, probably. Um, that's wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To be fair, I left seven years ago. So my, my sort of joke is like when the music system, when the recommendations are really good, then it's like, yeah, of course I built it. <laughs> when it's like not good, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I had left seven years ago. I don't know what you did. So, you know, so, so to, to be clear, like I, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that has happened in the seven years since I left. But I've heard from people still at Spotify that like foundational, it's like still sort of my ideas and to some extent, even still my code running it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Like I started at Spotify, I was very lucky in a way. Like I grew up in Sweden and, and yeah. you know, I knew a bunch of people from school and they, you know, went to this company obscure music streaming startup with this crazy idea to put all the music in the cloud mm -hmm. and you know call spotify and i ended up joining and you know and i think you know 10 years later or whatever it is uh, actually no, it's crazy it's 12 years later um yeah you're right i mean it's you know it's a massive success and and having been there from scratch i, I think was sort of one of the reasons i turned into like a degenerate startup person because like being part of that journey and like that growth was, was was amazing but yeah it was a fun problem i did a lot of other stuff at spotify too like i did a lot of data engineering and data science and business intelligence and other stuff but the music recommendation system was was um was, funny thing is actually a large part was it what, what of it was skunk works like i i actually built large parts of it on weekends and evenings uh oh, kind of on my own really? uh, for, for large parts uh, of the time and then like eventually i was able to convince people like Spotify needs a music recommendation system. Let's actually oh, productionize this. Oh, wow. So up until you built that, people could search for their favorite artist, they could find this album that they want to listen to, and they could listen to that, but there was no, you couldn't have a song that you liked and say, just start a radio on no, this. No, no, there was no recommendation until, there was some very basic recommendations, but they weren't really like smart and based on machine learning until 2011, I think. Uh, actually, uh, not quite, but, but roughly speaking, yeah. Um, are there aspects of this that you can dig into yeah, on air? Totally, absolutely. Uh, so Spotify, what, what Spotify ended up doing that I think is, you know, like the, the best approach when you have tremendous amounts of data, which Spotify has, is essentially, you know, what's called to uh, collaborative filtering. So the idea is like you have all this data about what people listen to and also what people, uh, what, what playlists people create. Uh, that data obviously like says a lot about, you know, if someone listens to a lot, if, if you see a lot of people, this sort of intuition is, if you see a lot of people listening to tracks A and B, like if those correlate a lot, then those tracks are probably pretty similar, right? And the same thing on an artist and album level, right? Now, you know, computing all these like pairwise correlations, it turns out to be, you know, very inefficient because there's like O and square, many, you know, and there's like 30 million tracks, right? right. So, so the question is like, okay, you, we probably need something smarter. At that time, uh, there was a competition, I think, I don't know if it's like people remember it today, but you know, it used to be a big thing back then called the Netflix Prize, right? Like Netflix had this sure. like big competition where they, yep. they open sourced a bunch of data about movie, movie ratings and then offered a million dollars to the first team that would beat the, the, the benchmark by 10%. And it was solving the same kind of problem. Is it is very it similar film recommendations? V system? Very similar, uh, the, with the exception that in the Netflix case, people gave one to five ratings, right? In the uh, Spotify case, like I didn't have that ratings information, right? Like right. I just knew when people listened to a track, right? And, you know, and I could aggregate it up and look at like how many times people listened to it and get sort of, you know, an idea of like how much they like it. So it's sort of the same idea. Turns out actually like review and Netflix has like, they've stated this too, you know, they mostly moved away from re reviews or ratings. Like it doesn't really matter as much as like the implicit signal of people just like what they pick. For sure. But anyway, so, so I ended up building a lot of uh, models in that vein and, and, you know, and all those models were unsupervised as opposed to Netflix case, which is supervised because you have sort of a label like X and Y, but, but it's the same idea. And, and in particular, the idea that I, uh, that I pursued and that, you know, worked really well was matrix factorization. And, and so roughly speaking, you know, like kind of distilling it down to sort of intuition here, like the idea is like you put, you, you create this enormous matrix, very sparse matrix where every row is a user and every column uh, is a track or an album or an artist. Right. And so you, you end up with, you know, 10 million, item, 10 million rows or, or something like that and, and 10 million um, items, right? 
um, again, like this matrix is, is extremely sparse, right? It's yeah, mostly yeah. zeros. Yeah. And then, but the interest in this matrix is how many times did this user listen to this track, right? Now, you know, like there's a bunch of techniques and, you know, and, and there's like traditional ones like PCA and SVD. Uh, I ended up using a bunch of different ones. Like in particular, I used a lot of NLP inspired models, like Vortvec was a model we used a lot. There's also a few other ones. Like oh, yeah. PLSA is like an old school version. Uh, Netflix had a bunch of papers and, and this one that, um, I forget, it's by who, Korn and Volinsky, was, uh, that, that like people used a lot back then. But, but they all boil down to the same idea, which is that when you factorize this matrix, you, you find a low dimensionality representation of every user and every item. And these representations are just small vectors. Like they're vectors of 40 uh, uh, real values. So you have this like vector space now where every user turns into a point in a 40 dimensional space and every track turns into a point in the 40 dimensional space. Right. And the, the dot product between the two, like sort of, you know, you can transform that into like, like a, a prediction of like how much does yeah. that user like that track, yeah. right? In that space now, as it turns out, tracks that are very similar tend to lie close together and same with users too. So be in that like lower dimensionality space, you know, four dimensions or whatever, hundred dimensions, uh, uh, you, you have this like nice sort of ge geographical like property. The space doesn't mean anything. There's no like the x-axis like doesn't correspond to anything or yeah. the y-axis whatever, yeah. like yeah. it's four dimensions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But proximity means something. If there's two yeah. points that are close to each other, it yeah. means like those tracks are very similar. Yeah. And you, you end up seeing if you're plotting, you know, uh, different, you know, genres, you end up seeing them clustering really well, right? Uh, so the next question is like, okay, like for every track, how do we find similar tracks? And that turns out to be kind of a messy problem because like you're in four dimensional space. So you, you really want to avoid this again, like this like Owen square thing where you have to like for every track, look at every other track and compute the distance. So I ended up building this vector database uh, called Annoy, which stands for uh, ANN, stands for approximate nearest neighbor. That basically helps you do those queries very fast. Because it turns out you can do all these like tricks in this like, you know, 40 dimensional space and cut down the search space very aggressively. And um, uh, so, you, you know, you can then take a user and in that space, you can then, you know, look for like track vectors that are close to that user, you know, remove any track that the user has already listened to because we have that data. And then those new, those tracks then turn out to be great recommendations for that user. Mm -hmm. Or you can take a track and look at like similar vectors to that track. And that turns out to be, you know, good you know, uh, similar track recommendations or good sort of input for a radio station or, or something like that. 